when I arrived, realized that there was nothing. I had to start everything myself. The object, my objectives and the objectives of the foundation didn't line up in the end. Refused to compete for years, then competed against a blue belt, won my first competition, and then lost all other blue belt competitions. Like, you have to have an A game. You can't just be like well-rounded in the beginning if you want to be a good competitor. It's not the same. Like, you get guys that are good hobbyists because they're like kind of tricky in every situation, but like, if you put them against someone good, they can't deal with like a high level game in any particular area. If you want to reverse that situation, the guys at a similar technical level and you've made a mistake, you're going to have to expend some energy to level the playing field again, to get back to a neutral situation because these are because sometimes the kids are running, just grab a gi, get changed, and you see like the legs are like muddy. <laughs> like, bro, what are you doing? Like, you can't go on the mat like that. You see like muddy footprints all over the mat. I'm like, this one source that they make is like, so gloopy and slippery like you cannot actually pick it up you can't like if you try and <laughs> i'm not joking if you try and use this it's, it's right. not even really a sauce man you put a spoon in it it will like run away from the spoon welcome back to the everyday perspective podcast today's guests are sam crook and frank fellas welcome yeah, thanks for having us man it's no worries great. Awesome. How's your day been? You've been on the road a little bit today? Yeah, we've just come back from a seminar down in Nuki. I had a Nuki seminar down there. So it was like a couple of hours of teaching. It's only two hours away from where we live, where we're staying with my dad in Torquay. So I headed down there and here's not far. It's on our way back, so it's convenient. Yeah, happy days. <laughs> in the way back. We don't have to do any details or anything. Yeah, nice. Well, thanks for coming in. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, and yeah, obviously you've been out in, in Cameroon for a while, mate, with the, uh, the Francis Ngannou Foundation doing the work there with Frank and the rest of the lads. So what brings you back to the UK on this occasion? Um, well, it's a long story. Basically, trying to make it as short as possible. Um, so I moved out to Cameroon in 2019. Originally when I went there, it was supposed to be only for one year as like um, a volunteer, uh, how to say like to help out as a volunteer for a year um, as a jiu-jitsu coach. I didn't really know the situation of the gym there, how how it would be, or, or I thought that I was going to help an MMA, an existing MMA team mm -hmm. with their groundwork in jiu-jitsu, like be working with some MMA fighters and kind of elevate their level on, on the ground. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there wasn't really any students there and I'd have to start everything from scratch. Um, and that would be mostly with kids like, I never, no one was, they gave me any information before I showed up, you know, so they were just like, oh, just see how it is when you get there. So when I arrived, realized that there was nothing. I had to start everything myself. Um, so started off like that, started, you know, trying to recruit people in the village to come to the gym, mm -hmm. find people that were willing to come and train, try Jiu Jitsu. Um, and it was a really slow start. We had like, cut, the first day was four kids that came and they were, all from the house that I lived in. Okay. So it was like <laughs> nobody actually came. Um, so yeah, we started off like that and then their friends started coming, uh, you know, after a few days and then their friends' friends and it started building like that. But um, yeah, so after, I, it, it started building quite quickly. Like the first day from, from four, within maybe two months, we had like 30 or 40 kids there. Okay. But, then things like the initial excitement wears off you know they've seen now what it is whatever there's you know they're not giving away free stuff <laughs> they're not not getting any presents or whatever you know like yeah there they, they don't know they may be like we're giving out stuff or taking them on trips and stuff like that so they they want to be part of it you know and when they figure out okay it's just training it's like yeah. day to day is like the same 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 kind of thing it's a grind <laughs> yeah exactly then they're like okay whatever so then a lot of them don't come so frequently right they it starts to die down again. You get that initial spike in interest and then things kind of like level out. And at that point, and then it gets to the rainy season as well. The, the, the leveling out kind of uh, synced up, unfortunately, with the rainy season, which means that it's pissing it down with rain all the time and people don't have transport there like cars and, uh, you know, whatever like they do yeah. here. And their parents don't take them to the gym. So if the kids have got to go to the gym there, it's because they've decided to go to the gym and they've gonna, they're have they gonna go and walk to the gym, which is can be anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours away from the house, like walking there and back. That so, far? 
yeah, yeah, some of the kids were walking two hours each way. Um, so as you can imagine, when it's like pouring down with rain, kids is, are it, like, is it that bad, the rain there? Yeah, in the yeah. rain season, it's really heavy. Is it? Nearly every day. Feels like a rain season here at the moment. It's supposed to be right off. <laughs> yeah, it is every other week, mate. <laughs> it's miserable, it? So basically, what, what was happening is like, we, at the same time, like, the, the, the interest was like dying down or the excitement was dying down. The rain was getting heavier and heavier and people were like, yeah, fuck that. I'm not going to go to the gym, to, like, fucking walk for four hours to go and get wet and learn how to joke somebody and go home again. Um, so... It was really quiet. I was like, loads of days, ended up in the gym waiting for students, no one showing up. You know, this is like, I've been there for four or five months, something like that at this point, I think. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, what, what the fuck? I'm in a village in the middle of nowhere in, in Cameroon, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. Like I've left, I, I just finished the degree. I've got like a stuff I could be doing. I left my family. My mum's uh, been suffering with cancer for a long time, so she was ill when I left already. So I'm like sitting in the middle of nowhere and things are like, nothing's happening. You know, I've got no students. I'm like, I feel like I'm wasting my time here. You know, why am I gonna stay here for a year when, for one, you can't learn jujitsu in one year, right? It's not something that's like a short term thing, like let's do jujitsu for a year. And then, so I started to think like, what is actually, like my goal here, what's, what's the point? What, what am I doing? Cause I've got to have some kind of goal or objective to, to kind of keep moving forward. I've got to have something to aim for. Mm -hmm. I can't just work aimlessly like a, like a robot. You know? And I so, guess you couldn't even train yourself at that point very much, could you? No, I had no yeah. one to train with, no one. So that's the, that's the other thing. If it, had, if it was like a gym with established fighters coming out of that, I could at least get in my own training and you know, yeah. Even if you had some winning adults, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like regularly I come couple, in. A couple of guys, like I think there was three guys that were like fairly regular in the be beginning. Um, but again, they were beginners and they were like progressing slowly. They were, they're super strong, the adults there, because they've grown up working on a farm, working in sand mine, doing hard manual labor their whole life. So they're all super strong, which is a bit of a disadvantage, you know, when you're learning a technical sport because you start to rely too much on on your physical attributes and everything like that doesn't apply to the kids there because they're small, right? So when you're training with the kids, they have to learn technique because they're, they're gonna try anything on someone bigger than them, it's not gonna work. But when the guys are already the biggest guys there, then they don't care about the technique because they can kind of stop the other guys with their strength because there's no one good to take advantage of that, right? They're all beginners. So they're like already the, the lions in the room kind of thing. But um, anyway, so yeah, things were a bit dead there in the first few months. And I was like, because I was supposed to be there for a year, I was like, what's the point to stay for one year when I'm not going to achieve anything in that one year? You know, like at the end of the year, what's, what's going to be my purpose here? Like, after, I'm going to have what, a couple of white belts. I'm just, all, everyone's still going to be white belts. They probably won't even be very good white belts after a year because they've all been learning like together from scratch. Um, so I'm gonna just waste a year just to show people some techniques and, and then go and there'll be, and then it will just dissolve away to nothing again. Because there was nobody else teaching MMA, nobody else teaching, like I wasn't part of a team teaching, I was just teaching by myself, right? So if I left, it would just back to, back to zero again. So I was like, okay, either, this is like, like I said, four or five months in, I was thinking either I go home now and don't waste a whole year here for no reason, or I could just stay here permanently, like dedicate myself completely to the project and like for, we're talking like five, 10 years and see what I can achieve with, with the kids that are here. Because like I said, jujitsu is a long-term skill building um, project, right? It's gonna take like 10 years to, to get to black belt more or less. Um, so I was thinking, okay, why, why not? Why don't I, is it like a bit of a weird thing to do if uh, your average like guy coming from the UK to just move to a village in the middle of nowhere and just have nothing to do except teach jujitsu to kids in the village. But I was like, for me, it was like at least kind of interesting, kind of like a, something motivating, mm -hmm. a, a, like an exciting thing to try to do, like a challenge. So I was like, okay, I like the challenge of living in that kind of harsh environment with like with 
no water, no electricity most of the time, um, nothing to do, no money, you know, no f family. I couldn't speak French, so it was like no one to speak English to. So it was like super hard situation. I was like, if I just live there, like that's a challenge for me, like to to move somewhere and, and like commit myself to stay permanent like that. So I was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm gonna do that. Like, I'm, I'm in. So, so the more crazy, the, the more interesting it is for me. So I was like, I'm in, I'm gonna stay there. Then, so I've been there for four years now. And after four years, like, um, this is getting a long way around to answering your question. Like I said, it's a long answer. So no, yeah, it's fine. basically the object, my objectives and the objectives of the foundation didn't line up in the end. So I thought that I would be, if I taught the kids to a high level and make them like world-class jujitsu fighters or, or competitors or whatever, that they would then get the opportunity later on to travel and, and make a career in jujitsu if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So if they have the skills and they're competent to do it, then we could find the support and get them you know, out of poverty and get them involved in sports at a professional level. And, and so you so you're you're in your in your mind you thought they'd have the funding there maybe to them. Not necessarily the funding, but I thought there would be the willingness to to promote it. You know, to to get the support from from outside, mm -hmm. as in, there's plenty of jujitsu companies and and you know even if you're talking yeah. sports clothing companies and whatever that would want to sponsor a project or a a team coming from like that kind of foundation that would happily you know, pay the expenses for kids like that coming from those that kind of background yeah. to to travel and and support their career, you know, or at least in the beginning to like give them the chance to, to make, try and make a career. I was about to say, they probably just need to step in some, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's just, it's just giving them that opportunity yeah. to, to try to, you know, to, to show what they've got basically. But in the end, the, apparently the, the goal from the foundation was more as a community center where they, for kids to go and practice jujitsu not just jiu-jitsu, but any martial arts that they could get coaches for, um, which is, is still a cool um, objective, a, a cool purpose, I guess. Have somewhere for kids to go and um, practice and, and be part of a team, feel like part of something, have yeah. friends and have something to do, something to be part of, right? It makes sense, but then and I think both goals can be aligned. You can have both at the same time. You could still have a community project, which is like for your average kid in the village to go and have fun. But then among those kids, you're gonna have some that are gonna reach a high level, right? They're gonna get good if you have a good coach there. Yeah. And then why not give those kids, the ones that do take it seriously, why not give them the opportunity to take it further? Yeah, and and I imagine in in those situations they can commit to jujitsu, you know. Like yeah, you the said, kids in not village, a, yeah. yeah they got not a whole. Yeah, they got nothing else to do, so they could commit way more than a lot of other, a lot of other kids, and, and especially in England and stuff like that, you know. And then, like you said, if they get that opportunity and they get get good enough, then it's 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 just horrendous that they don't have that opportunity to then be able to pursue something that they may well be good enough to, to be a professional in or even a high level jiu-jitsu practitioner. Yeah, like I, su I fully support the idea of having a community center, community project, which is just as a like social hub for kids to yeah. like be to together and, and make friends and be part of a team. That's a great idea and a great plan. But like I said, amongst those kids that are in that community center, if you have a high level coach that is able to bring some of those kids to high level athletes, mm -hmm why then deny them the opportunity to to do something with it you know it's, especially when it's easily available from outside support you know if you if you just promote the situation promote the project yeah. people will jump on board because people want to help out with stuff like that you know yeah, yeah. Mm. a lot of people want to help with something and they don't know any sort of meaningful cause that they can help with so when if you just do the right uh promotion and, and like raise awareness about the project there are people out there that are just waiting for 
the or looking for something to to link up with you know to help with so yeah so did you manage to get much support then um firstly scramble have been helping us since the beginning they're the the main guys that have been helping us out since day one they've been helping me out personally since like 2015 like sending me jiu-jitsu gear geese and, and whatever shipping stuff out to brazil while i was out there as a purple belt um you know, never asking anything in return. I never had a contract or anything with them, but they've been like just sending really? me stuff for years. That's amazing. Helping, yeah. helping out. That's so, amazing. Um, yeah, when I moved out to Cameroon in 2019, I gave them a call and said like, look, I'm going out to Cameroon to do this social project teaching at the foundation. Would you guys be interested in supporting that as well? Seeing as you're supporting me already. And they were all in straight away said yeah okay we'll make you some custom geese they shipped us out 100 custom geese wow. for the kids there so it took a little bit of time to get them made by the factory and stuff but they like that was a agree before i even left for cameroon that they were going to send us geese and everything like that so that was like a big um moment a big like change in in the in the early days of the jiu-jitsu team there because in the beginning the kids were just training in their own clothes we didn't have any geese so when we had our first shipment of like 50 custom geese, the kids got like super excited. You know, they're all in like matching uniforms and stuff like that. So then the, the numbers started to pick up again at that point. Um, you know, it was like now something, it was actually like a real thing rather than kids just showing up to a sports hall and playing with their, you know, with their own clothes on. Mm -hmm. They feel more like a team and like a, doing a real sport kind of thing. So that was definitely a big help and Scramble, you know, took all of that. Um, took responsibility for all of that basically like never asked for anything back so thanks to them if like if it wasn't for them the project would have probably not made it as far as it did mm -hmm. um but and apart from them we never had any uh financial input from anybody else the foundation and what everything else that was um going on there was basically paid for out of Francis's pocket and he's like a very proud guy so he doesn't like to ask for outside help he doesn't want to be seen to be asking other people for help I've I said to him a number of times like for me like I understand that I understand where he's come from he had a very hard journey you know he's a very proud man and worked for everything he has right so I get it but I was trying to explain to him like the way I see it it's not him asking for help. It's a social project. It's not him asking for personal help, right? Everyone knows that he's financially stable now. He's, you know, had a good career, having a good career. It's getting better. Um, so, but I, I think he doesn't feel comfortable asking for any, any outside support at all. He wants to pay everything by himself, which is great. But then if you... Don't, if you can't afford to fund a whole team of kids and stuff like that, there are plenty of people that would be willing to help. So there's no need for somebody to pay that out, out of their own pocket. Yeah. Even if even if you could, why? Why does it have to be a personal, you know, personal like dip your hand in your pocket and pay for everything? There's, there's people that companies that would support. Well, that's that. what I was about to say. There's a lot of companies that would definitely want. Yeah, to Yeah, companies on board that are like like that. You know, they they, <laughs> they got so, some companies got so much money that they can just. You know, to, especially with good causes like that, you know, they, they're just tax write-offs. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I get it. I get his way of thinking, but I don't think it's necessarily, like, correct because, like I said, he doesn't have to take it all as a personal thing and think, like, no, he doesn't want to ask for help. He wants to do everything himself. It's not his, it's his foundation, but, like, that doesn't mean that other people can't help, for it, help out with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Hi gents, just interrupting the episode to tell you about our sponsor Eden Clinic for Men. You might remember episode 13 when we had Dr. Angela Service on talking about male testosterone deficiency. Um, this is potentially linked to things like low mood, um, low energy, obesity, low libido. So there's a number of different things that this could have an impact on. So if this applies to you, your mates, your dad, your brother, or even if it doesn't and you want to get a baseline number of where your testosterone levels are at, then check out the link below and get yourself a well-man check booked in and they do a full blood test, which will also include your hormones, so your testosterone, but also diabetes check as well, so your HbA1c, uh, your lipid profile, which is cholesterol, triglycerides, so the fats in your blood, um, kidney function, liver function, so pretty much 
everything you need to check to maintain your quality of health. So check out the link below, get yourself checked out and stay in tip top health. So where, where is it currently at then? So you said there was that, that conflict between what you yeah, wanted to so do they, and, and what was happening. So where are we at now? So basically they were unwilling to accept outside help basically or accept me looking for outside help. They said like, no, we don't have the money to send the kids to compete and we don't want to ask for help. So we're just going to stay as a community project for now. And I was like, look, but I can't, I'm a jiu-jitsu coach. I'm a competitor. Like, I've t- taught these kids like seven days a week for four years. They're fucking good. Mm. Like, they can be like world champions in the, in the kids' division, you know? Mm. There's a bunch of kids that were super talented and super well-trained that could be like winning gold at kids' Pan Ams and stuff like that. And I can't sit there as like a, a full-time jiu-jitsu coach that's doing nothing but that and not have any students compete and just have no goals. Like my goal is what? Just to run a community center for the rest of my life and and never have any, yeah. it's not even like a just, I have obviously my personal goal is to like, it's, it's gratifying to see your hard work pay off and to see the students achieve things, out, you know, your students go on to achieve stuff in terms of like winning tournaments and stuff. It's kind of like a gratifying personally, mm-hmm. but also that's what they want, you know, they're, they're, that's why they're training there, to, to change their life, right? They're, they're not there because they were interested in jiu-jitsu and just want to learn jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. They're there to use, they're using jiu-jitsu as a tool to change their life. Mm-hmm. So if, if, that's not, if that's not what's happening, then they're, they're not going to come anymore. They're not going to train. They're not, they're not there to train for no reason. You know, they're there to train and, and for a better life. For life, yeah. as a job basically yeah. you know trying to make a career out of it mm-hmm. so I was like look if I'm if you're saying I, I can't take the kids to compete I can't like there's no goal in few, any even in a year or two years there's, there's nothing planned to do something with them then I'm going to have to think about going back to the UK because I can't just stay here with no goal in a village in the middle of nowhere you know it's a it's not an easy a life there you know so um, and they were like okay fine just like that <laughs> yeah so I was like okay so if, I was like if you want to do anything you know where I am you're like yeah okay okay and that's what so that's what's brought you back to the UK now then yeah because I was like well, I can't, either I stay there and do, not, do nothing just teaching them day in day out but also even if, even if I did decide to stay there now that the kids know that this is now the situation because we didn't really know that that's what in the beginning it wasn't kind of like, I didn't dig too much into what are the end goals because I can't show up somewhere, start teaching kids jujitsu uh, and be like, yeah, so I want to take them to world championships, whatever, whatever, and none of them know anything. I was like, they're stupid. Like, they don't even know if I can train the kids to, to that level yet. So I was like, let me just stay quiet, work, teach them every day. When they get good enough, then I'll be like, look, come and check this out. Come and check these kids out check how good they are, see what they can do. I think they can do something with this, you know? And I'll put the work in first, but it's like, keep, keep working away in the background, get the results, get the, get the, like the proof is in the pudding, you know, like the, look at what we've done here. Maybe we can take them to compete now. And I thought like people would buy into that and see how good they've become and support the idea of taking them away to, to like test himself on a world stage and and you know and compete basically, um, but apparently not even even with the level of the kids being what it was, there was still no interest in in doing that. So I was like, oh fuck! So I've just trained these kids for like four years, thinking that it would inspire people to like support them, and it didn't. It's a real shame, man. So I was like, okay. I've, going to yeah. have to go back. Yeah, so what's the plan now you're here in the UK then? So, um, it's a complicated story again, man. Um, so I'm here with Frank at the moment on a six-month, he's on a six-month tourist visa mm-hmm. um, because this is the easiest thing to apply for initially, right? Um, we've recently, I've recently adopted him in Cameroon. Mm-hmm. The paperwork's not out yet the paperwork's not uh apparently the the court decision has been made 
and obviously with the level of cor corruption everything there is in Cameroon there's always everything takes longer than expected always drags on and on and on there's always another thing you've got to pay for another thing you've got to wait for oh there's also this the judge is on holiday you don't know when he'll be back and then you've got to pay like whatever whatever so this has been ongoing since we stood since last uh, October or November we were supposed to have there was like a six month delay from December to June and then we had uh, restarted the process in June and we're trying to get it all finished before he turned 18 um, last month mm -hmm. so we, we had the the court hearing and whatever in, in Cameroon before he was 18 mm -hmm. so they take it from the the date of the um, what do they call it in English like when you introduce something into the court it's the date where yeah like the start of the process yeah the yeah. start of the process not the not the the, end. the date of the yeah, cool. the decision mm -hmm. made so we we had the process introduced to the court before he was 18 then had to wait for the decision the decision came out after which we don't actually know what they've decided yet right. um Apparently we'll know next week, but like next week could be next year, you know, with Cameroon. They could like, oh yeah, next week, and then you don't hear anything from them. So they said next week, and then they've told us we've got to pay to have the decision like on paper or something like this. We've got to actually pay again, even though we paid about one and a half grand already at, like in, for various fees. We've got to pay an unknown fee again to have that. And then we've got to pay an unknown other fee to get the, if if it's successful to get me put on his birth certificate as like um, his adoptive father, basically. So we're st these are like the next steps. Um, but even after all that, because of um, the way the documents are, the way the, the, the law is, when you adopt a kid in certain countries as a British father, the kid automatically becomes a British citizen, right? But Cameroon does not qualify for that. So a kid adopted, a Cameroonian kid adopted by a British father does not become a British citizen. So it means we have to apply, either apply for Brit, British citizenship, can't even talk, or we have to find another way for him to be legally allowed to, to stay here and live with me. But even if he is, he'll be technically um, or legally classed as my son, but he won't be classed as a British citizen. So like on his paperwork, yes, in Cameroon, he, like everything his birth certificate will say that I'm his father, his adopted father. But they're like, that doesn't mean you have the right to live in the UK, apparently. Whereas if you, there's plenty of other African countries, even like South Africa, I don't know the list, there's a bunch. I think even in Angola or, or some other countries that if you adopt someone from those countries as a British father, they become British mm. straight away, but there's another list. Yeah. It's, it's all just yeah, but, politics. Yeah, right. politics. So basically, because Cameron's not on that list, then we need other means of. Um, yeah, keeping him. Here. Yeah, yeah, keeping him in the UK basically. So at the moment, he's on a tourist visa for that reason because initially we, we didn't know uh, if we could get the the citizenship or or whatever with the adoption so we kind of started the process because we didn't have time to wait because he was going to turn 18 right so i was like if we wait everyone's taking ages getting back to us and stuff like that. time's ticking by i'm like look you wait for a decision it's going to be 18 already and then you can't do the adoption there anyway in this country i think you can adopt even an adult for example if somebody lives with like a foster family or something like that and then for whatever reason they can't get the paperwork done when they're younger, like they can't get the stuff signed off, they can then decide as an adult to be adopted into that family still. You know what I mean? So like, let's say I live, you grew up living with a family in, until you're 18, mm -hmm. but you're not legally part of that family. And then you're like a 20 year old, you can say like, no, I wanna be legally part of that family. So you can sign it for yourself. But in Cameroon, you can, you cannot adopt anyone older than 18. So we had to get all the paperwork done before yeah. that. All right, well, well done. So just, just a quick one. So what's, what's Frank's background then? Yeah, so in regard why, to his why am I trying to adopt yeah. him? This is a yeah. situation, yeah, why? Good question. That's a long story and you'll forget yeah, to like, give no, some key sorry, information. Hey. So basically, um, he, 
has grown up living with his aunt, right? Wow. So he, his dad abandoned him when he was born, basically. He left him with his mum. Um, and then his mum couldn't afford to, to keep him, so she sent him to live with his, her sister in the village. And she went to work in, in the capital city. Well, she was a cleaner in a hotel. Yeah, she went to work cleaning the hotel in the city, sending money back to help her sister pay for his upbringing. Um, and then he used to go and stay with her in the, in the summer holidays, basically, like when he was a kid. So he used to go to Yaoundé, stay with his mom, and then go back and spend the rest of the year going to school in the village. Um, he didn't, I don't know, what year was it? Where? Let me just think, I think, okay. Yeah, I think it was October 5th, 2017, if I'm right. So Frank's mum passed away unexpectedly. She got ill, had some stomach problems, and like that. came to the village to see, to see her sister, called Frank's aunt, the one who was looking after him, said like, look, it's, it's, something's wrong here. Like, so, so she said like, come to the village, I'll take you to the hospital, whatever. Got there, so apparently she was like really sick unexpectedly and without knowing what, what the problem was, they took her to the hospital to have some sort of examination. Um, they said they need to urgently operate on her and she died on the operating table. So, so that was uh, five years ago. So that was, yeah, 2017. So in the six years now, yeah. So that was just two years before I got to Cameroon or a bit less than two years before I got there. So first Frank would have been how old then? Like 13? He was 12. There? 12. Yeah. Yeah, man, that sucks. So sorry to hear that, mate. And then, um, so I got to Cameroon two years after that, or just, just all, like around about two years after. Um, and his aunt sent him to, to the foundation, like for something to do, you know, like go, go. There's some coach that's just showed up there, like from the UK, go there and, and see what he's teaching, kind of thing. So that's when he showed up with <laughs> his cousin. Is it seeing like what's this white guy teaching there? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he said, "What did you think when I first showed up?" I, me and my cousin, we went there and I see one one white guy and say, "I," he say, "I." My first day, I just like this for fun, you know. I not take it, take like. I just there to play, play, play. Just, but after just mess around. Yeah, <laughs> after. <laughs> Free mom, I start loving, loving, start come every day, every day training, and start work with him like that. And today we together. Yeah, class. But you couldn't even speak to me in the beginning. Huh? What was I saying? <laughs> it's just no two words in French. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. And how is your name? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, this is the way that I kind of like um started to try to make a bond with the students. That was just like, okay, I have to learn their, all their names. That's all I can do. I don't know how to speak to them, so I'll just learn their names so at least they know that I'm paying attention to them, you know? If I'm there and I don't, I can't speak to them and I don't even know their name, they'll be like, this guy's clearly not interested. But if I know them, like I keep calling them by their name, at least they'll be like, okay. Off camera, uh, you're talking in French. Your French is, is your French good now? What's his French like? Good, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, not like it's okay it's village yeah. French yeah <laughs> yeah basically so I'm sp I speak like I learned uh, French in the village in Cameroon right so it's not like a I don't know academic French as okay. you would say like yeah. but I can speak like fluently village Cameroonian French you know if okay. that's if that's, <laughs> if that's a thing, a thing yeah. um, obviously I've got a weird accent because I've got like a Devonshire British accent speaking like African French so it's a bit in, in, uh, like mixes up a bit weird okay. <laughs> but they, they can understand me I speak to them my wife doesn't speak English so obviously what she doesn't speak yeah, English I'm married, uh, I say married traditional marriage it's not like a legal marriage but I have a, a wife in, in Cameroon and a, a newborn son oh, congratulations, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. what's he now, called Leandro Nice. Because basically it was like um, the, the moment where he found out that she was pregnant, it was like the same time that Leandro Lowe died. Mm. Do you know, I, I saw that and wondered if that was the link. Yeah, yeah. yeah so so nice gesture, soon, I always said that if I had a, a son, I'd like to call him Raphael after Rafa Mendes mm -hmm. because he was like my jujitsu idol um, 
throughout like my whole like blue purple brown belt until I even went to train with them in the US as a purple belt but then like I said we found out that she was pregnant and then it was only a couple of days after Leandro Lowe had been shot so I was like okay well, he's gonna have to be called Leandro then it's, know, a, so. it's a cool name as well <laughs> yeah so now he's got like um, it's, a cool, it's a cool name he's got like a a Leandro's like a Portuguese name right, or Brazilian name yeah. so then my dad's name is Michael Michael Crook my full name is Sam Michael Crook but then for him I want to you can't put Leandro Michael it's a bit weird so the french version of michael is michel right so it's leandro michel crook so it's like a portuguese french english name <laughs> <laughs> like a, a white a white cameroonian villager speaking french with a british father that yeah 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 that's really he won't cool, say currently i don't think he's speaking much of anything at the moment to be honest but no <laughs> soon he'll be speaking french <laughs> so what's what's the situation there then with um with uh, sort of a, a, a a bloodborne son uh, oh. can they come to the UK yeah yeah so for him it'd be much easier than with Frank okay. because basically for if you have a, a child like a British um, father has a child abroad yeah. then they have the right to become a British citizen mm. right so basically all I need to do is I, I bought his birth certificate back from Cameroon with me I need to get a British birth certificate made and then from there you can get him a British passport made mm. so what, he'll, what about your what about your partner no, for her it's going to be um, a bit more complicated again because first of all we're not legally married, and then after that you need you know tests and stuff. But probably she can't speak English, like I said, so that's obviously a factor. Um, basically, all of the the UK immigration stuff is super strict and and tricky. Yeah. So we we had a we had an asylum seeker called. Um Callum, Callum on, and uh, his story was is was crazy, and you should genuinely go and watch it. I probably shouldn't because it took this poor guy fifteen years to to get refugee status from coming over from Sri Lanka. But he said, was it? Didn't he say that it's got a bit better now? Wasn't it? Towards yeah, with well, it. Yeah, they've, they've kind of sorted their, their yeah. Shit out a bit, so. they, they, I think the Home Office have, have changed it a little bit to try and support genuine, you know, sort of people that are trying to get into the country a bit better. But yeah, so I've got yeah. myself in some kind of like a tricky situation in terms of like <laughs> coming in I was just about to say yeah, yeah. I, I, so I went from basically living here to moving to Cameroon but single and then like with a wife a newborn she's got a three year old son as well so I've got a three year old stepson um, and then I've got Frank and another boy Brian who's like 15 who are both like uh, orphans that I've adopted right so I've got two adopted teenagers a stepson and, and a newborn and a wife that don't have the right to live in the UK and then I've got no money and I'm trying to fundraise and teach, you know, when I say fundraise, I'm trying to teach seminars and, and raise the funds basically to, to get all of those things sorted with time, you yeah. know, like. Fucking hell, mate. You said you like to set yourself goals and challenges, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I never went a bit too far, though. <laughs> So, so on that then, mate, that, let's take this opportunity to maybe talk a little bit about how people can maybe support and, you know, sort of what opportunities there are in regard to supporting with sort of fundraising and, and that type of thing. Yeah, well, um, for jujitsu people, anyone that has their gym or, you know, that's watching that, like, they can mention to their coach or, or gym owner or whatever, like, we're available for seminars anywhere so we can travel anywhere around in the UK we're looking to book seminars to to raise money basically so if anyone's interested in booking us for seminar get in touch um, around the local area more in like southwest here we can we're available for private lessons as well but obviously we're not going to go all the way up to Scotland for a private you know but if anyone's within like driving distance then obviously privates and things like that um, and anyone that's just interested in, in helping us out um, without booking us, there's always the GoFundMe that we've put up online. So there's a link to that, I think, on my Instagram bio. Um, and there's a link to a PayPal page on Frank's Instagram. So you can post the links for our Instagram pages and people can check it out from yeah. there. Yeah, awesome. We'll make sure we put all those links down in our description as well. So if anyone's watching this and wants to donate, then you can just do that straight through us to yeah. you guys. So... So I, I, I kind of know of you because I'm from this part of the country and I remember you, I think, when you were sort of a purple, but I actually met you at the Welsh Open years ago. I think I dropped you back to Torquay randomly. Mm. It might, you what might... Was that, like 2000... It was like 
13, 14. I'll tell you when it was. This might ring a bell. So do you remember Mark Doyle? Yeah. So it was the, it, it was the event when he fought Lou Long and Lou caught him in a bow and arrow choke. Mark wouldn't tap. Great so we switched to an arm bar. Off. Wouldn't Great tap. Details, Listen, and then it turns out that he was asleep the whole time. Huh? So he put him asleep in the, in the bow and arrow. The ref hadn't spotted it. That happened more than once. But it yeah, was, that like, happened. It sounds like a really specific story. That <laughs> like, oh yeah, I remember that. But if I remember you another day that happened to another one of my teammates. Did that it? He got put to sleep and then armbarred as well. Yeah. Because the ref didn't know he was no asleep. Way. But yeah, Mark come off the uh, off the mats and, uh, you know, we were teasing him about getting choked unconscious and then he started complaining about his elbow and didn't even know he'd been <laughs> armbarred. But yeah, it was, about, it was about, it must have been about 2013, 2014, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I can know that's about, that's about the same, that's when I just started competing, I think, like, because mm. I was um, not, a, like, into sports growing up. I wasn't a competitive person or anything like that. So it was like, when I started jujitsu, it was more just for self improvement and having something to, yeah, so I was trying to better myself and learn something new and actually do something with my life because I had a few years where I was like basically wasting my time doing nothing, just drinking and smoking and, and nothing else, mm -hmm. you know. So then I was like trying to get myself out of that kind of lifestyle and like, look, let me fucking do something worthwhile. Um, but it'd be, good, it'd be good to hear about your jujitsu journey, mate, because obviously. You, you do extremely well in competition from what I can see. Um, that's what I mean. <laughs> uh, you're pretty well in competition, but obviously a lot of people watching this might be familiar with the story and the work you do in Cameroon, but might not actually know your, your journey of jiu-jitsu yourself. So what yeah. year was it you started jiu-jitsu? 2009. Okay. Yeah, so I started 2009, but when I started, it wasn't, um, it wasn't big down in the Southwest or anything like that. Like um, my coach at the time, um, Darren Yeoman, he was a purple belt. When I said there was no black belts around, as far as I know, we used to have like seminars with guys coming over from Brazil and yeah. stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it was like much lower level of jujitsu in general. There was much less competitions, everything like that. We had a couple of guys from our gym, a couple of blue belts that would like go up to competitions and stuff like that. But I never. It was basically the Hereford Open, wasn't it? That was pretty much. Yeah, it wasn't like the culture of like competing for like hobbyists in jujitsu. It was more like if you're a super interesting, super, like one of the people in the club that are, yeah, yeah, like had top the guys, desire one of the to top go guys, and compete, yeah. like, yeah. but it wasn't, especially, I don't know, maybe in certain clubs, but down here, it wasn't really pushed or anything. And I never had that in mind when I, when I went to the Jiu Jitsu club, you know, I wasn't like, oh, I want to learn this to go and compete. I never, I never even inquired about that. You know, I never con uh, took that into consideration that, oh, I would learn this and then probably go and do competitions. You know, I just thought, just learn it, just for something fun yeah. to do. Um, so I remember when I was a white belt, still like the first time I did a competition, the guys in the gym were like, "Oh, there's a competition in a couple of weeks. You should, you should do it." I'm like, "Competition? What kind of competition? I'm a white belt." You know, like, they're like, "Yeah, but you can fight other white belts." I'm like, "What? What are you talking about?" <laughs> like. Why would, why would white belts fight? Like, I don't know anything. You know, I was like, why would I do a competition when I don't know anything? They're like, yeah, but that's how, that's how it works. You're gonna go to the competition, you're gonna, you're like, that's how you get better. I was like, a bit confused by that, like, um, concept, you know? I was thinking, like, competing means you're, like, the best, like, or the elite of, of your sport. You know, you're gonna go and compete because you're good. You have a chance of winning something. I was like, I don't get it. Like, you're gonna compete when, you don't, when you're a beginner? Like surely you have to learn before you go and compete. I was like, I don't feel like I know anything. So I went to a competition and got choked out in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally, yeah. I don't remember much because I think I have PTSD from that. <laughs> <laughs> literally, uh, in my first ever competition, all I remember is I went to a competition that I didn't want to go to because people persuaded me to compete. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll go with you. I'll do it. I'll sign up. I got guillotined, I think, in 30 <laughs> seconds. And I was like, fuck that, I'm not competing anymore. I told you it was a bad idea. <laughs> that was, I was like, I, was like it's, I told you it was a stupid idea. I told you I don't know anything. Why the fuck did you make me do this competition? Now I feel like a fucking more of a moron than I felt anyway. Like, I felt shit at jiu-jitsu anyway. Now I feel 10 times shitter because I just got choked out by another white belt. <laughs> yeah. You never tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got choked, not choked out, I wasn't unconscious, but I got tapped in like 30 seconds. I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm clearly not meant for this. I, I told you guys I'm not competing anymore. Anyway, so then didn't, I might have actually done a second competition at white belt, 
but I think I've completely blocked that one from my memory. I don't know what <laughs> happened. I didn't win. That's all I know. Right. If, I, if, I'd, if I'd won, I would have like probably, you know, thought about it a bit more, but I'm like, push that one out. I, I honestly don't know if I did one or two, but I remember specifically being guillotined in 30 seconds and was like, fuck that, like I'm not doing it. Um, and then after that, for sure, I had like a year, at least a year, maybe longer, maybe it was like two years, break from competing. I was like, I'm not competing anymore. And then uh, when I got to Blue Belt, I started like learning some stuff, you know, so I'd get a bit better at jujitsu and was like, people, like a couple of people from the club were going to competitions. I was like, uh, maybe I, I, I do all right with those guys in the gym. you like, if they're competing and maybe I think some of them won something and I was like, oh, but I do all right with those guys. Maybe I can, maybe I won't lose this so quickly this time, you know, maybe I can try. So I, on my first jujitsu, on my first um, blue belt competition, I think I won the first one. And I was like super surprised. I got like a gold. Um, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. But I, in my memory, I lost my first white belt competition. Refused to compete for years. Then competed against a blue belt. Won my first competition. And then lost all other blue belt competitions. <laughs> so, like, so literally, I won one competition. was a bit like encouraged. Like, oh, yes. Like maybe I can do something. And then I literally never won a medal again at blue belt. <laughs> like got subbed like... I think I got some silvers, but I maybe competed four or five times as a blue belt, something like that, and like one gold. So it didn't go very well. And then I got promoted to purple belt and I was like super ashamed. I was like, <laughs> imposter syndrome, yeah. like, what the fuck? Like, why did you give me a purple belt? Like I've done five competitions or four or five competitions ever. And I only won one gold. I just, I went to the Europeans as a blue belt, lost in the first round, come back and got my purple belt. I was like, Cool. <laughs> <laughs> feeling, feeling great. Yeah. Feeling it is great, a weird man. thing, isn't it, though? Because uh, competition is very different to uh, just the skill acquisition of being a purple belt. Do you know what I mean? It's a very different yeah. thing, yeah, isn't there's, it? There's and so much other stuff that goes head. on. And yeah. realising that, though, isn't it? It's realising that is a, it is a slightly different And thing. sometimes it's like, um, you know, like your coach knows what's best for you most of the time. If you've got a good coach, then they know what's best for you. Mm -hmm. So in that kind of situation it can maybe in Darren's mind was to like promote me to kind of make me take my training more seriously and 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 like take the responsibility of the higher belt and kind of step up mm -hmm. to that which I think ended up being the case because obviously I had more success at purple belt than I did at blue belt mm -hmm. you know so I started to train a lot more and whatever because I was like fucking oh I can't wear this purple belt if I'm like losing as a blue belt, like I have to change something here. I have to train better, you know, mm. I have to get better. Um, so that's when I started training like properly, basically when. Do you think that, do you think the, the kind of competitors that you run into at higher belts played a role as well? So sort of white and blue belt, it's always, certainly my experience can be quite attribute based, just a bit of a scrap. Whereas when you get to sort of purple belt and, and above, I feel like it was probably a little bit more technical and that, that might suit certain styles. Yeah, I think I had like, I can't say I was technical as a blue belt, but I was like, I was more technical than I was athletic for sure. Like having no athletic background and everything like that, I was more like uh, using the technique side of jujitsu to be slightly good, you know, to be like passable. I was like, okay, I can, I can manage. If I learn these techniques, I can, I can do something here. Um, so yeah, for sure, like. I was getting probably overpowered by some guys at Blue Belt and just not, I didn't have the, the technique level enough and the experience to be able to deal with those kind of like physical assaults, you know what I mean? Like sometimes you literally feel like you're being assaulted, like you got a giant Blue Belt trying to tore the coat like side to side. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to deal with that at that point. But I, then when the purple was like you said, being a bit more of a technical approach, you kind of have a bit less, it depends on the guy, right? It depends on who you're competing against, whatever. There's still guys that will like blitz you even at black belt, you know. So, but there's a bit of a, a bit of a change, I think, a bit of a transition. Or at least there was back then. Now blue belts are super technical. So, but then I don't think that was the case back, like, especially down here in small competitions and stuff like that. Um, and it's, like I said, when I was uh, lower belts, like white and blue, I wasn't interested in being good, a good competitor. I wasn't interested in being good at jujitsu 
from a competitive standpoint, right? So it's only like after when I started competing more and yet it's the competition itself that kind of um, inspired me or what's the right word to use? Probably inspired, yeah. Like um, kind of lit that spark to, to try to get good at it, you know? I was like, okay. In the gym, we didn't have that competitive vibe down there. So it was like only from going to competition a few times, I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. You know, like mm -hmm. maybe it's, it feels like, it felt like a different kind of jujitsu mm -hmm. as to what we were doing in the gym. You know, it was more like a sport, whereas in the gym it was more, it wasn't like self-defense, but um, it's more relaxed and kind of like just learning skills. Like hobbyist. hobbyist. Yeah, hobbyist yeah. jujitsu club. And then when I was going to the competition, I was like, this is kind of like a different thing. It's kind of interesting. Um, was it? Was it? Were you, were you at Fightworks at this point? Yeah, yeah I, I was. Fight, I was at Fightworks from White all the way until Brown Belt. Well, yeah, okay. I only moved away because I went to study at university, and that was yeah. no, surprising. Isn't so it? I think back then, Fightworks had a fairly decent little MMA team as well, didn't they? Because they were doing. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they were running the UFC. They had all those fight nights and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of no gi guys. Uh, there was, um, yeah, good, good like hard training there, but mm. not really that like uh, technical gi jiu jitsu. Yeah to the competition level or it was technical jujitsu, but it's for MMA probably more so, right? Yeah. It's in competition. There's like other things which are important other than just technique. You have to like your mindset is super important. You, and you kind of have to, you either have to learn that from trial and error. Like I did, like, because I was going from a gym, which didn't have many gi competitors, right? They had like MMA fighters there. Like you said, I was kind of, learning them how to manage the mindset and strategy and everything like that myself from losing so many times and, and going to competitions. I was treating the competitions every month as like a training. Like I was going once per month to a competition on my own with no coach, no teammates, nothing, just taking a train up country somewhere, compete and see like what I would learn and like try to write stuff down afterward. Like, okay, like I need to work on this because guys do this in the competition, you know, like, seems like this is what happens in a match. Like we weren't learning that kind of stuff in the gym. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like a, intriguing for me as well. And that kind of inspired me to keep competing more and more. Yeah, and it was, it's like, a, it's a different thing for me. The mental side of thing is the most interesting for me, the most um, addictive, let's say, yeah. because what, how to say, what's the best way to phrase this is like, um, it's appealing to learn jujitsu to have to learn the skills, but for me, like the biggest skill is being able to st stay calm under pressure and be able to to deal with stressful situations and still n like be relaxed. That's like a skill that you have to learn, right? And you can't learn that in the gym because you, it's not really you, well, no, yeah, it's, it's stressful as a guy off the street when you're in a white belt to go into a gym full of people and, 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 but that you get over that pretty quickly after like a few weeks of training, you're now just like part of the team. You're training with the same guys every day. So it's not so intimidating to go there anymore, especially if you're in a good gym, like friendly people. But when you're going on your own to competitions with like no coach and no one cornering you or whatever, it's very stressful and, and you feel a lot of, it's, it's intimidating, right? So, I was like, I want to be able to deal with that. I, like I was, I wasn't confident I could win. I was like, I, I want to learn and try to feel confident in that situation. And I felt like the more I was doing it, I was getting more confident. I was getting more calm and, and composed. And I liked that feeling of like learning that skill, you know? So that was the most, yeah, the most addictive thing for me that kept, that pushed me to to train more and, and tra take training more seriously. Yeah, and then you said you uh, you got your brown belt at Fight Works, and then was it Fight oh, Zone that you went up to in London with Marco? Yeah, yeah. So basically, as a purple belt, is when I was started to take jujitsu more seriously. Um, started competing more. I was com that's when I started competing every month. I lost when I started doing like that. I still lost the first match every single time for one year. So I competed <laughs> once per month. So like 12 consecutive competitions, I lost the first match. I was like, it's like painful. Every every time you go back to the train station, sitting waiting for the train to go home on your own, you're like, I fucking suck. Like, I suck so much. Like, I'm keep, like am I wasting my time? Is this like, 
am I gonna start to actually win at like some point or I don't know. So anyway, after like a year of losing at Papa Bell, I started winning suddenly. I was like, oh, what the fuck? I like actually won a competition. Like I didn't lose the first round. I was amazed that I didn't lose in the first round. And then I was amazed that I won the second, third, fourth round and actually like won finally at like something. That must be so weird mentally though. Like like you said, you went for a whole year. Yeah, consistently anything, losing. Like, consistently losing. First round that's, every that's time. That's a real strong mindset because I know what I'd be like. I'd be like, fuck this. <laughs> yeah, Shit. like 12 like, competitions. Like I would. I know what I'm like. I'd be like, I had a fucking pissy because I lost a couple of matches on my first tournament, let alone, do you know what I mean? Like it's fair play, mate. It's, it's fucking amazing. That's what I'm saying. I wasn't naturally gifted in like any sort of like athletic sense and we didn't have the the high level technical training to like make up for that so I was just losing all and, the time and, and then once you've done that you just started winning again well if you lose winning, enough times yeah. you'll learn how to not lose yeah you know you you make enough mistakes that you start to recognize those mistakes and be like yeah I keep doing this I keep I need to not do that anymore I need to not do that anymore and eventually when you've got rid of all those mistakes maybe you'll stop losing and then you start winning. Yeah. So were there any any sort of few things that you kind of look, looking back that 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 you changed that were really key to you then sort of turning that corner, whether it be technical mindset, preparation, warm up, diet. Mm -hmm. no, I think it was just more like a slow process for me because like I was learning from like those. It was like a once a month training session. Like so, I'd learn competition jujitsu by going to a competition once per month. Right, so I'd make notes and try to figure out what was going on. Like, oh, what are the guys doing in the match? Well, how are they scoring on me? How are they, like, what are they doing? What am I doing wrong that they're scoring on me and stuff? And then I'll just like, after 12 of those, that was enough to That's fascinating. have like- That is, isn't it? Such a cool mindset, mate. Ha ha having a, yeah, it? having a so year cool. of like failure was enough learning for me to then yeah. do a better job, basically. Just, you know, I was still not, you know, by any means, like great, but I was at least not losing anymore. Yeah. Did you ever uh, compete any any of the bigger competitions at Purple Belt? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, when I started taking jujitsu more seriously, I was working as a dental nurse at the time, like, um, you know, just forty hours a week in a in a dental surgery, just cleaning blood out of people's mouths and whatever. It was pretty shit. Um, at the same time, in my head, like I'm just basically on autopilot, thinking about what I'm going to drill in the evening, thinking about what I'm going to drill in the morning, you know, and just like I said, doing like a monotonous, boring job that I wasn't interested in, just to pay the bills. Um, so I was like, look, either I'm going to do this jujitsu thing seriously. If I'm really interested in trying to get better at something, then I'll I can't stay in this situation to keep working this shit job. Yeah. Um, and expect to be like one of the best in my division or best in the world or whatever. It's not going to happen. Like the guys who are the best are not in that kind of situation. I was like, and I don't have the the finances or like family, like wealthy family to pay for that kind of thing. So I was like, look, I'm going to fucking quit my job. I'm going to borrow some money. I'm going to move to Brazil when I was at Purple World. So I just literally did that. I quit my job, went out to Brazil, got um, sponsored by Connection Rio because I won the the British Championship in 2014, and I saw in a jiu-jitsu magazine that it was like um, like a application or like um, what do you call it? Like a you could apply for, to to be a sponsored athlete by Connection Rio. So I applied. So I've won a couple of competitions at Papa Bell, you know, trying to make myself sound a, a little bit good. <laughs> like I'd won some important stuff. It wasn't that important. Anyway, so they agreed to sponsor me, which meant basically I had like a place to live in Brazil for free. Um, and yeah, so I, so I moved out to Brazil for five months, slept under a table, um, not consistently, but like, I, was, I was like, sports athlete, so I was moving around, they're like, okay, we need this space, can you sleep on, we'll put a mattress under the table today, tomorrow you can go into that room, oh, there's someone else coming, then you can go out here, you can, so I was just moving around oh, the house right. like on a mattress. Um, five months training at Chekma in uh, Rio mm -hmm. with Ricardo Vieira. And then after that, went to train with the Mendes brothers for three months in the US. And then came back from there. No, no, before, when I left Brazil, I went to Europeans in Portugal. Mm -hmm. I got third place in Europeans as a purple belt. So that was like the biggest thing I'd won up until that point. You know, I'd won some competitions in Brazil, but like there's no major tournaments that I did when I was there. Um, just the local circuit kind of thing. 
So yeah, I got third at Europeans and then went to the Mendes brothers, busted my knee, but kept training, kept competing. I didn't realize it was that bad. It kept giving way every once in a while and stuff like that. But came back, was drilling. Um, I think, I, yeah, I got my brown belt when I came back. My, Darren gave me my brown belt when I came back from the AOJ. Um, then I was drilling, like pre pre preparing for a competition in London. I think it was like IBGF, uh, London Open, something or other. Yeah. And my meniscus tore in my knee and like locked my knee completely. So I was walking on crutches for five weeks with my knee bent. Um, yeah, waiting for surgery kind of thing. Couldn't straighten my leg. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I was like, okay, because I'd quit my job, dedicate myself to jiu-jitsu. I had shitloads of debt at that point from moving to Brazil, move, uh, going to the US, like putting it, everything in. And now I'm walking around on crutches and I can't straighten my leg. I was like, this might be a bit of a risky career choice. You know, like maybe. That's <laughs> uh, literally what I was thinking. I was like, okay, so I've basically put everything into this basket now, like gone all in and now I'm fucked up and I can't even walk. So I was like, maybe I should do something else like as a backup plan, mm. you know? So I was like, okay, I'll go to uni. Um, I didn't have any qualifications. I left school at 16 with just GCSEs because I fucking, I hated school, right? So I was like, I'm, as soon as I was 16, I, I walked out, went to work in a cafe. That's the time when I was like, basically, like I said, uh, smoking and drinking and doing nothing useful, right? Working in a cafe, smoking and drinking, just earning money, doing nothing productive. Um, so I had no qualifications. I couldn't get into uni, so I just went, I, I was basically thinking, okay, what can I do? What can I study that will be like a better career than working as a, a dental assistant, like a dental nurse, you know? Like, I don't want to fucking suck blood out of people's mouths for the rest of my life, like that or jujitsu, like, Cause I was like, I can't go back to that job. You know, if I've, I've quit that job to go in all in on jujitsu, I was like, I don't want to go back to that like 40 hours a week, just working in a dental surgery. So like, what else can I do? So I was like, okay, it has to be something which will allow me to still be involved like heavily in jujitsu. So I want something sport related, whatever. So any, any end, I decided to study physiotherapy because I was like, okay, it's human, biomechanics, human movement, whatever. I can work with sports people maybe you know, yeah. maybe work with jiu-jitsu athletes, something like that. Like I said, didn't have the qualifications. So I, being how I am, I just decided to buy textbooks for biology, chemistry, whatever, just read the textbooks front to back and then called a school, said, can I take an exam? Um, so I, I, I like learned the A levels basically with with no teacher or whatever. Just read the book by myself and then went and took the exam and, and passed them all. Like we were like ninety eight percent, and then got on a degree. That's the short story. But yeah, got on a degree uh, in London. So looking for universities. Like I didn't even look for the the quality of like their courses or anything. Like that. I was like, which gyms are close to <laughs> good jujitsu places like in the UK. So I was like looking like oh, where are the best jujitsu gyms in the UK, where like they have physio courses that are like good. within, that, within yeah, travel yeah. distance from there, so I can go do a degree and train at a higher level gym as well, like make the most out of that situation. How much How much time at that point when you started that course did you get to train? Was you oh, like- While I was studying? Yeah, like how, how it could, was you able to train quite well with that? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask so him for me. The, really. the course was like full time, right? So it's like, yeah, you've, full time study. You've but, got placement um, with physio as well, right? So you've got actually- yeah, not, We didn't until, I think it was in the second year yeah, we okay. started. But um, yeah, I was, Training every day. I was t I. I forgot about this actually, but I got a scholarship at the university, even though jujitsu was not like a recognised sport, because I'd by that point I'd won like British Championship a bunch of times, like at, uh, I think at blue purple. No, I didn't win anything at blue. At uh, purple, a couple, like a couple times, and I think maybe at brown already. Yeah, I think I'd won it like one time before I went to uni. I think so. I applied to like look. Um, sports person or whatever like I saw that they had like this bursary scheme where they'd support like athletes to yeah. to keep training at yeah. university so I like, might as well apply for it like I've won some shit like maybe they don't have a jiu-jitsu thing but you know they, they, yeah. yeah they 
agreed to it and said like, yeah, okay, we'll make an exception because of the what you've achieved so far, you know, like we'd like to support you. So that basically meant that I was uh, just had like free access to their gym and stuff like that, which is otherwise like quite expensive. Um, and had the opportunity also to win money once a year in like the university um, tournaments, which like, um, yeah, they didn't realize. Normally the way it works or worked at my uni was that they pay you for winning gold medals at the university games or the equivalent, I can't remember what it's even called, but basically yeah. university games once a year. If you win gold medals and you're a sponsored athlete in that sport, then they'll give you prize money to support you for like, what are you doing? They didn't realize that in jujitsu you can win multiple gold medals. <laughs> that, you know, because in like athletics or whatever you do, yeah, you race yeah, and you yeah. win. I was like, so yeah, I won the, the weight absolute gi and no gi. They're like, what? <laughs> what? What is that? They're like, we can't pay you for four medals. Like, what, what are you talking about? They, you didn't tell us it was four medals. I'm like, you said I'd get like a grand per gold medal. So like, this is how much you owe me. Like, they're like, no, we can't give you the, we can't give you all that. Like, we can pay you for like two medals. I was like, okay, fine. But we'll whatever. take two. Yeah, we'll take two. Yeah. <laughs> so they paid. I think I got like the, the first time I competed for the uni, I got like two gold and two silver or something like that. And they're, they're like, we'll pay you for one gold and one silver. I'm like, okay, whatever. I can't argue because it's free money, whatever. I never got paid like a thousand pounds to win a medal in jiu-jitsu before. So that's what they gave me like a grand. So that helped a lot. Um, so you said about how much did I get a chance to train? I was studying full time and I was studying like my goal was to be the best in the year to be the best on the course basically like i went there as an older student i was 28 when i started uni so a lot of the there were some other older students i think there's one person older than me and a couple like a, a little bit younger but the majority of people on the course are like straight from school right mm -hmm. like 18 19 whatever so they're there just to go to uni have fun whatever i was like trying to change my life you know i was like if i've got a shit situation i'm working a shit job that i don't like i need to do this degree to to get out of that situation. So I was like, I'm not fucking around. I'm here to like, um, to get like a first class like degree and at the same time, like maintain and improve like my jujitsu status and level or whatever. So I was like competing in as many tournaments as possible while I was at uni as well. I was doing like, uh, I think every year throughout the three year course, it was like, um, a bit bad timing, but we have the end of year exams, right? At uni, which is like in physio is like six or eight exams within like a one or two week period. It's like yeah. stacked and they're long exams. You've got to sit there for fucking ages, writing like pages and pages. So I was revising like crazy every year that like exam period was like the same time as the British championship. So I would like be revising all day, all night, like, on a Sunday, then go and compete in the in the British Championship or whatever it was. There was an English Championship one year uh, at the same time as the exam. So compete in some reasonably big tournament, then go back, you know, keep revising and then do the exam in the morning. And I managed to do, you know, do that. Balance, yeah. yeah, I managed to balance both and like win, win the jiu-jitsu tournaments that I was doing at that time um, and still get good results in uni. But like, I fucking, I hated uni as well. Like I hated school in the first place, but because of like the confidence that jujitsu gave me, I thought like maybe I can be good in school, even though I was, I was like clever in school when I was a kid, but I didn't like it. I don't know why, but I didn't like that like environment of just having to learn stuff you're not interested in all the time and being forced to like just study stuff, which is, you know, Shit. Like yeah, like I Shit. studied jujitsu because it's interesting for me. But like just to study like, I don't know, maths and shit like that. Like I was like fuck, I hate it. Like um, but yeah, I got good at jujitsu and I was thinking like okay, I hated sport as well when I was a kid. I was like I hate sport now. Like I'm good. I'm British champion like yeah. in jujitsu. So maybe I can also be good like academically. Maybe I can do a degree. So I went back to uni, did all that, and was like nah. <laughs> I, I was wrong. Like, I still fucking hate it. I still hate, like... Did you finish school. your degree? Yeah, I finished it, but I was, I, for the whole last year, I, I wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, this sucks. And I was like, on the, calling my mum every day, just bitching on the phone, saying like, I'm going to fucking quit this degree. Like, she's like, don't quit. I'm like, 
I know I'm not going to quit. I was like, I'm not going to quit. <laughs> you just want it. Yeah, I'm just on the phone because I want to fucking quit the because it's so are, boring. Yeah, the third year's a fucking I remember you well. saying to me that you you yeah. was like, I fucking want to quit so bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a sport rehab degree in like my 30s, so very similar. Yeah, yeah. And it's so hard when you're older as well because yeah. you're just like, you don't want to spend all your time studying and like, when you take it seriously and you want good results, you realise that you can't just fuck around and, you know, you've got to put the work in to get the results. Like, you know that from jujitsu as well. So, when you're in a degree, you're like studying super hard, trying to get good shit, and you have like no life, and you're just like this. Like I can't <laughs> even. I want to train more. Yeah. I want to train just... more. I want to like give more of my m mind to jujitsu. I don't want to put my mind like in some shit subject about like NHS uh, <laughs> rules yeah. and regulations, yeah, NHS yeah, yeah. protocols, and have to like memorize all this stuff, like which I do not care about. Like mm. I don't want to have to give that much of my my brain to to that topic. Yeah. You know so. But I was like, look, I'm I'm in now. I was like, I'm gonna finish this degree. I'm gonna smash this degree, even if I hate it, because it's like another challenge, basically, just to say like to myself that I can do it. You know, like I want to prove to myself. No one in my family had gone to university as well up until that point. Like my dad's a builder. My mum worked in like uh, insurance and stuff like that. When I and all my all my family were in the building trade, basically like roofers, plasterers, uh, bricklayers, everything like that. So they were all telling me to get a trade. You know. I was like, I grew up wanting to be like an artist. Like I said, I was a waste of space artist, musician. Um, and then when I went to uni, I was like, look, I'm gonna fucking finish this and just shut everyone up. Just like, yeah. cause they're basically everyone's trying to tell you why you're wasting your time doing that. You should get a job that's paying good money. You can just go get a trade doing this. Yeah, but it's for a better life long term, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But then it's like the same sense. stuff after as well. So it, that didn't change afterward, right? So you get a degree and you don't want to do it anymore. Like I was like, look, I'm not actually going to work as a physio. I was like, it's fucking shit. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to oh, do really? it. Oh, really? So you've done all that and then just... Yeah, I knew, basic, I knew already. So basically, you've done that and then just wanted to carry on with jiu-jitsu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, because I knew already like in a, like a year before finishing yeah. that I was like, I'm going to... When, as soon as I'm finished with this, I'm going to dedicate like my time back to jiu-jitsu again. Like, but I need to put the time in now to get this result so it's not a complete waste of time for me. So I know I like, okay, I've got this shitty piece of paper to show... That you're a physio, yeah. That just not even to be a physio, just to, sh to show... Something to show for all the work I've put It's in. weird you say that because that's exactly what you said to me. You mm. said that you ended up finishing this degree because you just wanted to prove to not just yourself, to your family, to people that you wanted, that you could do a degree. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, just well, you just, you, you just wanted the- Yeah, you just want to finish what you started, don't you? Yeah. And people think like, oh, they were saying like, when I went to uni in the first place, I was like 28, right? They're like, oh, you're going to be 31 before, when you finish, you're going to be like, I'm like, I'm going to be 31 in three years anyway. Exactly. Whether yeah. I yeah. degree or not, yeah. I'm still going to get older. Yeah. You know, so I'm either going to get older in the same shit situation, or I'm going to do something about it. They're like, yeah, but you won't be earning any money. I'm like, I'm not earning any money anyway. In the <laughs> you know, like, it's going to be a little bit worse, but at least I'll have done something. So then when I finished that, they're like, and told everyone that I'm not going to work as a physio. They're like, what do you mean? You, what? you just wasted three years studying. I'm like, it's not a waste. I was like, I've done a lot of shit. I've, in that three years I've been in London, I've been training jujitsu at Fight Zone, right? I've got my black belt in those three years. I've learned a lot of skills not just in jiu-jitsu, but in terms of like, I learned stuff about the body. I've learned how to push myself through shit that I don't want to do. Yeah. Like writing a dissertation, like whatever it was, 6,000 words, I managed to like somehow make it about jiu-jitsu, but. <laughs> I did the same actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Writing about neck injuries in jiu-jitsu, just be, yeah. and they were like, they seemed to like it, but I was like, I don't care if they like it, as if it's like acceptable to write about that, then at least it makes it bearable for me to do the work. Yeah. You know, like, um, so I, so you're saying you for me, a it wasn't a waste of time. It was more like a mental exercise and like, like self-improvement, trying to learn how, the same as with the competing in jiu-jitsu, learning how to deal with stress and a difficult situation and pressure and everything. At uni was super stressful and super, like a lot of pressure. And it's like, I wanted to quit, right? It's so easy to quit. So easy just to say that, like, fuck this, it's, it's difficult. I'm, I don't need to do it anyway. Especially when you know you're not actually going to use the paper. You're not going to work the job. So I was like, nah, fuck this. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to do it just, just to show that I can do it. To show myself that I can stick 
I don't know whether that's something valuable or not, just to show that you can do something that you don't like for a long period of time. But just, and, just talking to you today on this podcast, you've obviously got resilience because like you said, with your competition, you'd go to competition, lose, carry on. You know, you didn't want to do the physio course. You, you, you know, you got... You got moved into out your, to Cameroon. You moved went, out to Cameroon with shit. no real end to it and you didn't know what was going to happen. And then, and you know, all that. Stay there. You know, yeah, so so it seems to be recurring. It's a, it's, a, it's a personality trait, mate, definitely. Yeah, you yeah, know, like uh, putting myself in doing shit which I don't like yeah. or which is like uh, super difficult. And so just, just a quick one. Um, you said that you got your black belt. Yeah. Um, what What's like the top competitions you've won as a brown or a black belt? Uh, and, um, just, just, so, I, I'm just interested. Yeah, <laughs> so I guess top ones, so I've, as a black belt, like IBGF nationals, so like British nationals, Spanish national, Irish nationals, um, a bunch of open, so like British open, uh, what else, Irish, was it Dublin open? So, um, and since recently this year, uh, all stars competition, so like all stars absolute division in London, uh, where else, Birmingham. Recently, last weekend was grappling industry, so they're like less prestigious competitions than IBGF, but that's the most recent one. So, yeah, a bunch of IBGF competitions as a blah nothing, nothing on like international circuit. Oh, when I say international, it's like Spain, but. It's still a national competition. It's not a like Europeans or anything like that. Do you go and compete in them anymore or not bother? Well, the bigger competitions. Yeah. I've been, well, yeah. Yeah. The goal was always to, for me to try to push myself in competition as much as possible. But when I moved out to Cameroon, yeah. uh, I wasn't earning any money and I didn't have the ability to travel. So I was stuck in a village with no money teaching there's no competitions in Cameroon so I kind of had to give up competing for a while and focus on the students right trying to teach them I always wanted to compete but it just wasn't possible at that point like either I leave I don't teach at the foundation and I go back to UK and compete again and like do what I was doing before or I stop competing I bite the bullet and focus on coaching so I was like okay fuck it, I'll, I'll do that, like I've won it, I haven't won the level of competition that I wanted to to win, you know, I haven't got the results I wanted, but I've won enough to say like, okay, I've got a decent amount of experience at like every belt level, you know, I've got decent-ish results at every belt level, and now I think I can, I've got something to offer as a coach, so why not commit myself to that, it's a, it's a new challenge, it's not, it's hard to take yourself away from competing when it's so addictive, mm. You know, it's so addictive, the feeling of like going into that high pressure situation and trying to get results every time. But I just kind of like had to change my mindset. Like, OK, think of it as a new challenge. And now my my goal is to now, like, make these kids as good as I can. You know, so I haven't really been competing for the last four years. Um, I've done a couple of competitions. Like sometimes I, I jumped into like one or two over the last yeah three years started competing properly again this january i came back with frank in january we did all stars in london uh what else we did two competitions yeah, another all stars just, where yeah. you did liverpool oh, yeah, Man- was it liverpool you did or manchester? Uh, uh, london and manchester when yeah. we came back and we we got decent results yeah. there i can't I, remember exactly I, what how are, are you getting on frank he's doing good he's doing good yeah he's like smashing it yeah. He's only just started. <laughs> yeah. game, right? so for him, it's a bit, it's like different from, a much different situation than for me when I was a blue belt, right? For him, for a start, in a way, he's got an advantage. In a way, he's got a disadvantage because when I, what, what do I mean by that is like, he's got an advantage in terms of his coaching, right? I'm basically coaching him like full time. So like morning and night, like seven days a week, basically like full time and trying to pass on everything that I've learned from me basically going to figure everything out for myself, everything out for myself, like uh, losing all that for so many years, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out all those lessons and like how to pass that on to him, right? So that he's got like a shortcut. So that's like the advantage that he's got. I didn't have that kind of like personal coach like helping me like that. But the disadvantage is that in Cameroon, they don't have any jiu-jitsu competitions. So he's had to learn all of that and not have the chance to test himself. You know, so he's, I've been basically teaching him to be a jiu-jitsu competitor, like teaching him strategy, rules, 
technique, everything that he needs to be, that he needs to know to get good results. But he's not had the chance to actually put it into practice at all. It's very different, isn't it? It's yeah, so it's like the first time he ever competed was this January. So after three years of training, like the first time he'd ever seen a jiu-jitsu competition was that time, you know, so just turn up, compete, yeah, and immediately started getting good results. So obviously he can handle the pressure, yeah. which is like the key thing, right? Mm -hmm. So. What strategies do you, do you kind of put in place for yourself and Frank when it comes to competing? Because we we had Ricky Bellingham on um, and he was, you know, he competes a fair bit. And, and that was something we were quite interested in that one was around strategy. But what, technical technical strategy or, or mindset strategy? Uh, both. Yeah, I mean, what advice would you have for, for anybody watching looking to compete? Like have a game plan. Okay. Like doesn't mean you need to, um, you don't need, it, the fight is probably not going to go like that, but you have to at least in your head visualize how you're going to get the win. You know, you can't just feel like, oh, I'll just try and win somehow. Like, how? Oh, I don't know, I'll just try and win. Like, you need to know, like, I'm going to try to take this guy's back. I'm going to get to this position. I'm going to take his back. and I'm going to finish him from there. You need to know what you're trying to do. Then obviously, if it doesn't go that way, you have to adapt and modify your plan, you know, but don't go in there with like zero plan. You can do that at a later stage when you're like much more experienced and you've already you're already used to competing, then you can go and just like, okay, just be reactive and kind of go with the flow. But you can't do that from like day one when you've never competed before. You have to have like some kind of structure for what you're gonna do. Mm. So I would say for people starting to compete, is yes, it's like a different advice I would say for new guys that are new to competition as to like how to get good results at a higher level. But in the beginning, I would say like, have a game plan and drill a lot what you're gonna do and try to kind of um, think about what the other guy's gonna do in those specific situations as well. So you can't like go there thinking the guy's not gonna try to attack you. You know, you need to be ready for the fight to be hard. So you need to go expect some adversity in the fight, right? If you expect to smash the guy, you can be confident. It's good to be confident and think that you're gonna win. You have to think you can win to be able to win. You can't be like, oh, I'm gonna get smashed and then you suddenly win by chance. You have to believe you can win, right? But you also have to realize that there's a good chance the guy's gonna give you a hard time because he's also trying to win, you know, in most cases. So know what your plan is, but also know like the likely problems that you're gonna have with that plan. You know, so let's say you wanna, you can't just drill a single leg like all day, every day, and then think that's what you have to kind of like drill the situation, right? Okay, they got, you have to work out what's the ways the guy's gonna block or defend that single leg that you're trying to do and have like options around that you have to build like a small game like that and know that okay when you get the guy down then then what you're going to you're going to pass you're going to what you're going to do and then how how you're going to start to look to pass and you have to need, then see like how is the guy going to defend that and obviously as you go through the belts and through the years like that game will expand like a lot so that will happen with like every position but in the beginning you need to like almost have like a to b with a couple of branches on the way. So you have to have like a pathway and, and know like how to deal with problems on that particular pathway. Mm -hmm. And then try to bring the guy into your A game. Mm -hmm. You know, always like try to t try to bring the guy into your A game. Your A game will get like wider mm -hmm. as you go for the belts here. But in the, in the beginning, it's gonna be very narrow. You're gonna have like specific techniques that you're really good at, which is what I would say as well. Like you have to have an A game. You can't just be like well-rounded in the beginning if you want to be a good competitor. It's not the same, like you get guys that are good hobbyists because they're like kind of tricky in every situation but like if you put them against someone good, they can't deal with like a high level game in any particular area. Mm. They're just like okay everywhere. That won't work in competition, that will work against other guys like that but when you go against good competitors, they're gonna put you in their A game and then it's gonna be a higher level than your your all round game, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to develop a particular part of your game to a higher level as possible. You might ha you might have like uh, weaknesses elsewhere, but that's gonna 
you have to work on them with time if you want results in the short term. If you're not interested in results, then just work on your game as a whole. But that's also the, when I say have an A game, you have to be able to attack the guy. You can't just be reactive and, and counter everything they're doing if, when you're less experienced, right? You have to be able to put the other guy under pressure and make them defend what you're doing. So put them on the back foot and be the aggressor in the fight, you're going to give yourself a better chance of winning. Normally, it's like, I don't know what the st statistics are, but guys that attack first generally, or the guys that score first, win more often than not, right? It's, it's usually... And I'm sure guys it was 80%, I think. Yeah, sort of like yeah, you, you, have, you get momentum on your side, right? So you start against the guy, this is like, gives, gives you confidence, puts you in a better position as well, like, uh, like a better technical position to to score again or to to get to a more dominant position and it also like knocks the other guy's confidence in some cases or it's, it's more likely to knock their confidence if they start winning they'll be like okay it's, it's good and they'll they'll you know maybe go harder because they they feel like they've they've got the momentum on their side but when the momentum's on your side it can kind of make it easier to to keep winning the rest of the fight and then like lose less energy right mm -hmm. keep keep um, control of the situation. Yeah. You know, any t basically I was saying the other day when I was teaching in a class, jiu-jitsu is supposed to be a technical sport, which it is, and it's supposed to be a gentle art, which is not. Um, but you, technique overcomes strength, right? Technique does overcome strength, but when the other person, when you're both level, uh, both people are of a similar level, and the other person is in a dominant position, that means you basically, fucked up right you've allowed you've made a mistake which has ended up in the other guy getting into a dominant position on you now if you want to reverse that situation the guys at a similar technical level and you've made a mistake you're going to have to expend some energy to level the playing field again to get back to a neutral situation because you cannot expect the guy who, who is uh to, to get out of a situation when the guy is in a mechanically dominant position, right? That's why it's the dominant position because it's the guy has a better chance of uh, controlling you there. So let's say like if the guy mounts you or takes your back and he's the same technical level as you, he's gonna have a higher chance of controlling that. That's why it's a good position to be in because it's, it's difficult to escape from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can escape if the guy makes a mistake or you can escape if he's not very good at the position. But if he's very good there and you allow yourself to get into that position with him, you're gonna you're not gonna slowly and gently escape from the position. You're gonna have to put in a lot of effort, like physical effort, to make up for the mistake that you made by letting him get to that position. So yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 uh, You're gonna get tired, basically you're gonna get tired if you allow yourself to be put in bad positions. Yeah. That's cool. In it, the fight. I, I kind of knew that was kind of the case, but you just explained it in a really good way. So that was yeah. awesome. Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, um, boys, we were we wanted to ask you a little bit about, or, or more Sam specifically about life in Cameroon. Just conscious of time, and I'm sure you mm -hmm. you probably want to get home at some point. Um, you've already given us a little bit of detail in the beginning about kind of the program and everything else. So maybe if there's I don't know a particular story or you know anything the, the craziest thing that's happened in Cameroon since you've been there. What's the craziest thing that's happened? To give oh. them the mic. Um, <laughs> have you like? Have you? Is it? Is, I, I don't know. It's like a completely different stuff. culture. It's, yeah, it's so hard to think because there's probably a lot of stuff that would seem yeah. crazy, like conditions, you know I mean? like I don't know, wildlife, illnesses. Um, yeah, like stuff that would seem like crazy, maybe to listeners and stuff like that. But when you live there for a long time, it becomes so like everyday stuff that it doesn't stand out to you anymore. You know, like. Uh, Stuff like getting sick with malaria and stuff is like is like a like a getting a cold here. It's not, okay. it's not exciting stuff to talk about. Like oh, you got malaria. Like of course you got malaria. Like it's like saying yeah, you're going to talk about oh, I had a cold like last year. You're like oh, great. What was, what was the wildlife like? like, like wildlife is dead. It's all dead. <laughs> they basically <laughs> they kill everything and eat it. So there's not much wildlife. Oh really? But yeah, yeah. There's not. <laughs> there's, <laughs> like, the only wildlife that I saw was like three years ago. I saw a dead snake. <laughs> that's the only thing you've seen yeah uh, like living yeah like in my head so I, I thought it'd be like packed full of crazy no, animals yeah. like ready to eat you no you see a lot of stuff that's been caught that's yeah. killed 
already, you know, like for sale. Most literally, they eat okay. basically everything that they catch, like snakes, um, rats, what, Quit. crocodile. We had crocodile meat. So um, what? So what's your uh, what's your your best and worst Cameroonian dish then? Me and Frank ate snake meat and crocodile meat. Uh, one time last year when we were traveling, there was a place on the side of the road which was selling like bush meat. So we checked out what they had. They like, had crocodile. So oh, never fucking tried crocodile before. What's it like? Like pork. Ooh, yeah, and snakes like fish, basically like white fish. But yeah, crocodile. Was, was, like was it? Was it nice? Yeah, it was good. Right? Yeah, yeah. So did yeah. you get? Do you get any like sort of crackling or anything on it? No, it was yeah. a bit, the outside was a bit slimy. They kind of like boil it in sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the best cooked. Yeah, he tried crackling last week for, like we were coming back from a competition. I bought like, we buy like competition supplies when we go to competition. Because yeah. he normally has to cut like a kilo or two. I don't have to cut weight, but he's like, because I feed him too much basically. Yeah. <laughs> My nan keeps giving him packs of biscuits and stuff all the time. So he's, he's always like. It's that English soup. Yeah, yeah snacking. He's not like grown up in the environment where they have like all these snacks yeah, available. So crazy. now that he's here, my family's giving him all sorts of like snacks all the time. He's put on like an additional two kilos. So he keeps has to cut it back <laughs> off again before the competition. So we always go to the supermarket and get like post competition snacks and whatever after. I was like, okay, like crackling, let me buy a packet of crackling. And he's like, well, fuck is crackling. I'm like pork fat. That's yeah. gone hard. Like, because there they don't really Super cook stuff salty. like that. They don't have, yeah. they don't cook pork like that. They cook it like, um, they boil it in, boil it, in yeah. sauce so it gets like all squidgy. They don't roast stuff. They don't have ovens really. Everything gets cooked in a in a pot. Yeah, okay. What's so, the, what's the worst thing you've eaten out the there? The worst thing I've eaten. Um Wait. I'm Cree. <laughs> <laughs> For all you Cameroonian people, Cree is not good there. <laughs> what's what's the Cree? translation? Uh it's just a name, it's like a local dish. Right. So Literally, people that are not Cameroonian would not know what it is, but um, it's basically like a sauce which is cooked with some kind of plant. I don't know, some kind of plant that they boil it and it becomes like a really gloopy, <laughs> like a <laughs> slippery sauce that you right. eat with like a ball of corn. Right, okay. Like they call it couscous, so it's not. Is it's it not like, like they your hands and they, they, yeah, they yeah, like, so it's like, it's a, like stodgy, um, like stodgy, like flour thing. Yeah, and they, they have put a it few in. variations of that, yeah. right? So they have one which is made with corn, which they call like a uh, couscous. They have another one which is made with uh, like manioc, which is what? Is it manioc in English? Cassava. Cassava, yeah. Cassava in English, which is like um, fufu. So it's just stodgy balls of like yeah. cassava or, or corn. And then they eat with different sauces. One sauce that they make is like, so gloopy and slippery like you cannot actually pick it up you can't like if you try and <laughs> i'm not joking if you try and use this it's, it's right. not even really a sauce man you put a spoon in it it will like run away from the spoon how the how the fuck is <laughs> i'll show you guys a video after i'll show you yeah, a video after yeah, of, um, yeah. frank eating it and whatever but for me like does it just know, not I, taste I, great is it just it doesn't taste just... great and it's like the worst texture ever it's just oh, like yeah. imagine like you just shaved a frog did you get did you get ill from the food out there? Uh, no. Was you okay with that? No. Um, and yeah, I, I remember earlier. Typhoid. Well, you, said, <laughs> you get typhoid not right. from the food, but like from the lack of sanitation. I guess yeah. sometimes when you eat street food and stuff like that, it's not well prepared and, and things like that. So you get like it's pretty common to get typhoid. Normally, when people are sick, you go to the hospital. Like I took Frank to the hospital a bunch of times. He's got typhoid and malaria at the same time, like yeah. all the time. It's mad, isn't it? Well, and, and I remember earlier you saying about uh, there wasn't much water. What's yeah. the situation with the water out there? So in the village, we go to, we've got a, like a few pumps around the village, like hand pumps. You just pump, uh, we go with like a big 20, 15 or 20 litre container, pump up the water um, and drag it back down to the house. And, and, and yeah, and drink, that, just that, drinking water. That absolutely um, fine, yeah. Yeah, a couple of people came over and like, if you've got a sensitive stomach or whatever, maybe it's not fine but everyone there drinks it like that so I just for me I was trying to live like the rest of the people there you know like I didn't want to have like special like uh, yeah bottled <laughs> water I don't want to have bottled water or put like water purification or whatever I was like no one else purifies their water so why am I going to purify my water like if I'm going to live here like I'm not going to take malaria tablets and whatever you know preventative tablets because I'm gonna live here. You can't take that like permanently. It's like having antibiotics in your system permanently. It's not good. Mm. So better just to, if you get malaria, just get it treated. If you get some typhoid or whatever, get it treated. Yeah. That was my mindset. I don't know. And with, and with um, 
just like a quick one. You know, you said that you got all the geese sent over. Yeah. And I remember you saying about sanitation then. But what, what got in my mind earlier was how did you clean and keep the gym? The, yeah, I was you know, wondering the same thing. Without getting staff in, you know, with ge- dirty geese and I had stuff a few, like that. I had a few skin infections. Uh, not, <laughs> not as many as you'd think, though. Like maybe like three in four years. Something like that, but oh, that's pretty that's, good yeah, that's what they say, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's a meal yeah, of shit. Normally, it would be because I had a small cut or whatever, and I'd scratch it like you'd yeah. oh, and then yeah. you'd so be dead. Bad, but basically, how would we wash the geese? We didn't have any washing machines or anything like that, so the kids would like hand wash the geese every Saturday. So they just basically we had to pay somebody to come with. We had like a small concrete like pool outside the foundation which would basically pay somebody like a tenner to come and fill up with water every week Mm -hmm. and then they'd use buckets take that water out and wash the geese on the ground so bar of soap bucket of water and smash the geese on the ground and brush their collars but geese actually get more dirty there than they do here as well because for one the kids are coming like from the farm so the kids are coming like to the gym and you sometimes the kids are so dirty right because their parents don't um like control what they're doing. You know, it's not like here where the kids are always with yeah. their parents and they're, they're, there the kids are just wandering around on their own, right? So they can just be off playing in the farm, playing in-, in They just do what they want. Playing in the dirt, we're doing whatever. And then they just show up at the gym, like completely dirty, with like mud all over their legs and whatever. So you've got to go tell them to wash their feet in the, uh, and before they put the geese on, because sometimes the kids run in, just grab a gee, get changed. And you see like the legs are like muddy. <laughs> like, bro, what are you doing? Like, you can't go on the mat like that. And you see like muddy footprints all over the mat. I'm like, in the, in the beginning it was like that. I'm like, are you like, who is it? <laughs> yeah, uh, Let me see your feet. <laughs> but, yeah, basically, this is what it was. And like, who's got, who stepped on the mat? And then like, um, yeah, in, in a certain point, they started learning like, okay, we've got to wash before going on the mat and stuff. Cause they used to just like staying outside, playing outside and just like- Yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't it need matter, to stay clean. Yeah. Like you wash and then it doesn't matter if you get dirty again, cause you're just gonna be outside anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, guess, that. I guess with the infection and stuff though, I think half the problem in the UK is when people just are so sanitized yeah. and they go yeah, into that sure. sort of environment and then they're just so susceptible to stuff. Whereas I guess if you're used to playing outside and in the mud and stuff, you're just going to be used to I it. I think anyway. yeah, that's, that's kind of what my mindset as well is like yeah. try to build up a kind of natural immunity for like everything, like stomach wise, skin wise, everything. Like you don't really have a choice, either that or you just be like, lose your mind trying to stay clean and you can't. You know what I mean? Like, like, if you just start doing OCD, just accept like, it. Yeah, just you, yeah, just like that's how it is. Yeah. Like I was, I was saying a bunch of times to the guys, like um, that people will kick off, like go mad with people will go on the mats without, or they go off the mats with no flip flops and yeah. stuff like that. I'm like, no flip flops is like the worst, the least of our concern. Mm-hmm. You know, like, n- yeah, people don't even have shoes sometimes. You know, like, so what, like. The people, like I said, they come in with muddy legs and stuff like that, and like dirt all over them, and the geese are like, like dirty as hell after after one training session. So you have to brush all the, the collars and stuff. But it is what it is. It's like that's the way of life. There, like, the they work outside, play outside. The gym itself and like most buildings are not uh, constructed the same to the same standard that we have here. So like they don't have like double glazing. Uh, they're not like completely waterproof so air and dust and, and water gets inside everyone so everyone gets steady all the dust blows inside there's no windows it's just like a, a grill you know like like a yeah like a wire grill yeah. on the windows just to stop like someone actually climbing in <laughs> but it doesn't stop yeah. any dust and all that all that kind of stuff and what's what's like just the general sort of happiness of the children and what's the communities like because obviously they in, in the UK, we talk a lot about mental health and about all these things, and it's a completely different world out there. Yeah, and it's different. It's different. And for what's sure. that? What's the general like? You know, what's the what's the feeling like out there? Uh, like, just take things day by day. People with a much like slower pace of life, not so like rushing around. They don't have so much high standards like to live up to. Like you know, like now with so much social media and stuff like that, everyone's kind of trying to be like everyone else that they see on a TV or see online and stuff like that there, especially for the younger kids that don't have like too much access to social media. It's like, they're just, they don't care. Yeah, they don't care, care. Ignorance is bliss, right? They're not even worried about being clean, you know, because 
why should they? Yeah. Like, so what? They're, they're happy to just play in. They don't not trying to be. You're not trying to have all the latest stuff. They know that they, it's not a thing there. People don't have money. You know, like in the village, people don't really have money to buy. Like here, you see the kids with smartphones and tablets and PS5 or whatever. There, the kids don't even have like electricity. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to worry about having a, a PS5. They know that it's like, it's not an achievable thing. It's not an attainable thing. So they're just happy most of the time because they're not constantly wanting something better. They're just like, they've accepted their situation a lot of the time, which is also like, can be a negative thing, you know, because they kind of don't progress and they can kind of stay in that situation for the rest of their life because of that. But at least they're happy to do that. You see like what happens is a lot of people there end up just like spending all their times in bars, like all the time, drinking from morning till night because there's nothing else to do. So yes, it's good to be relaxed and, and go with the flow and, and not have too much, not have to have such ambition. It's okay to just like chill and have like a, and just live your life, you know, yeah. But again, that does come with a price of like, poverty kind of brings, puts people in a situation where they're not having a good life, they just accept their, their poor standard of living and, and like, don't think they can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Again, what was it like being, uh, was, you, was you the only white person around? And, yeah. And what was it like being like the only white person around and, would you, what, you say that people were drinking all day. Did you I get any trouble? Did you get any hassle? Mirrors. I didn't have any mirrors, so I didn't see myself. So I kind of forgot that I was the only white person around. <laughs> but I only see it like everyone yeah. else is black there. So yeah. mm. I'm not seeing any other white people. So I forget that I'm yeah. like, yeah. like maybe for everyone else, they see like a white guy going, yeah. going around, but I don't see any other white people. So I just get yeah. used to it. Yeah. But you wasn't treated like <laughs> any, any differently no, or um, like any, what I meant not, by it was not like in any sort of, like, sort of trouble or anything like that. Not any, no trouble or anything like that, especially not in the village. Like maybe wow. in in the big cities, like in Duala or Yaoundé, people were like don't know you, so they're like, oh, white guy, white guy, like uh, Leblanc. <laughs> oh, Leblanc. <laughs> so come on, Leblanc. <laughs> and they're like, they want, like, they just think that you're immediately rich. Like, they see a white guy and they think, like, money, like a bag of money. Um, so they'll always ask you for stuff. Like, and even if you can you can spend all day long trying to explain your situation or whatever to like even if you know somebody but they're like yeah okay this is bullshit he's white he's obviously has money like like he's just talking out of his ass like if he says he's not got money then but i guess in in a way that's true because even if i don't have money or if i'm not wealthy in this country it's still like a drastic difference to living in a village with like but people don't even have money to buy clothes and things like that. You know, we still have like things available here, which they don't have, like even the education system there, you have to pay to go to school. Um, you have to pay to go to hospital. Everything is like, yeah, money. you know, unaffordable. And here yeah, you have people have like free healthcare, government support and all that kind of thing. So you can, we still have the, the ability to educate ourselves and, and do things which they can't do. Yeah. because of their financial situation because we have the the government infrastructure set up and, and all those kind of stuff so yeah they, I they do have they are kind of right when they think that like we're financially better off than them even when we are like among the poorer people here mm. but they think that just means that you just have money to throw around you know which is obviously not the case yeah. so people are like oh buy me a beer buy me a beer like someone you don't even know just buy me a beer white guy buy me a beer I'm like fuck off like, buy me a beer what are you talking about like for me like uh, if I know the person if I'm at the bar and I'm like I'll buy myself a beer if I'm with a friend I'll buy him a beer of course like if I'm having something to eat I'll buy him something to eat if I'm with the kids the students or whatever if I go and buy like a a drink from a shop or something to eat from a shop I'll buy them something of course that's like the way it's, yeah. it's like that obvious everywhere. yeah yeah that but, I don't know but for me, it's not normal that you go to somewhere, someone you've never seen before, just, hey, buy me a beer. Like, he's sitting there on a the table with a beer already in his hand. He's like, buy me a beer. I'm like, fuck you, buy me a beer. Like, <laughs> what's your problem? Like, yeah. so I start, in the beginning, I was just like, uh, um, 
kind of shrugging off, like ignoring people when they're being like aggressive in that way. But in the, like, after living there for a few years and I was like more fluent speaking French and understood like quickly the like, way people are speaking and whatever, I'd kind of like play, play the situation a little bit and like just troll people basically. Mm. So I'd be like, buy me a fucking beer. I'd like, you ask, you tell me to buy you a beer, get off your fucking ass and go buy me a beer. Like, unless you want a problem, don't be fucking asking me to, to go and do whatever, whatever. Don't tell me, buy you this. It's like, you want to be rude like that, go buy me a fucking beer, you know? And just like, not like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> like, I'm not going to speak to that guy anymore. So I was like, okay, cool. That's like, job done. Like, that's why I want you to stop asking me for shit, basically. So like, I don't really want him to go buy me a beer. I just like, stop asking me every time you see me to buy you something, so. Yeah, um, crazy, it's just a, a different world, isn't it, entirely? I, they say it's unimaginable. Yeah, so. Frank, what's your uh, what's your favorite thing about the UK? UK is super good uh, than Cameroon. Cameroon life is not like this. We carry water, wash clothes by hand. You know, here is I think it's other life here. Mm. You know, it's what's your good. Uh, what's your favorite food? <laughs> mm. uh, cook breakfast. <laughs> Cook okay. breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Cook breakfast. Ah, uh, yeah, but yeah. not a bad shout, man. Or fry up. Yeah, every fry up. Bit got fry up every day. Is that, that's where the two kilos are going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The day in Cameroon, right? You just eat like for breakfast. Breakfast is not like a, a thing. You just eat if you're hungry in the morning. You eat what's left over from yesterday's rice or whatever. You know, you'll just have whatever's left from the day before. Mm -hmm. But here, you know, they fucking sausages, egg, uh, bacon, eggs, beans, like yeah. a full plate of like meat and protein and fat yeah. so he's like fucking hell this English breakfast is, is, <laughs> is good yeah, shit yeah, good, yeah. Yeah, amazing yeah. what else fish and chips yeah and Chinese he likes Chinese yeah, yes Chinese Chinese, Chinese is good <laughs> he likes yeah. special fried rice yeah so that's like um, yeah, that's good. I think I remember like sweet and sour chicken balls mate get them in there don't know. Yeah, that he hasn't, no. Has he had sweet no. yeah. It was like um, he had Chinese like at Christmas last year when my family like ordered Chinese one night or something like that. And then at first he was like, "What the fuck is this? Like sweet sauce on on like savory food?" And then after he's like, "Oh shit, this is good." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it must be so every, so fun like giving him all these new things. Like you know yeah. what I mean? Like being like exactly like the first time. He's a Big Mac, mate. Like <laughs> I've not given him a Big Mac yet, but we went for Burger King on the way back for a comp and yeah. like you know, take them out to restaurants and stuff like that, like where we can, with family for birthdays and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but it's not just like food, but like everything is like a new experience, right? Imagine yeah. you grew up in a village, you live there your whole life, you never travel outside of Cameroon. So the first time we come here in January, is the first time we'd ever been on a plane, you know, which was like cool for me, like to take him on a plane and just watch his reaction. Like he's like, what the <laughs> fuck? Did you like it? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, the other day we were like took him to the fair you know take him on the waltzes oh, make him yeah. sick as hell oh I saw the video actually yeah. he was laughing get, man, him to get him to Thorpe Park or something mate yeah, <laughs> I wanna, I, yeah. so I wanted to, yeah. to go up to Owen Towers but yeah. it's expensive right and yeah, when yeah, you're trying to like fundraise to take him to competitions and stuff like that I don't really have like money to throw around to go to Owen Towers but yeah all in good time mate yeah yeah exactly yeah. So. right boys I think we'll, we'll probably let you hit the road and go out of here nice one really appreciate you coming on no idea no idea midnight man yeah cheers guys thank you